Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Talking About Birds, the only Cardinal podcast that will not be making a herpes joke, because for us, that's a personal matter. My name is <laughs> Nate Heininger, and I am joined, as always, by my co <laughs> by my co-host, Ben Samorka. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I, 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 yeah, yeah. Hi, guys. All right. That and this week, <laughs> we will be discussing the Home Run Derby, the All-Star Game, the upcoming trade deadline and the rumors swirling around it, and the recently completed MLB draft. Okay, so when you first said that, I was thinking Ryan Braun because that's that's where my mind goes. I'm a Brian Braun hater. He admitted that he had herpes in order to <laughs> lie to the national media about his steroid use. And right. I'm, I am so mature. It took me a second to understand what you were doing. Uh, <laughs> and maybe I did I miss that part of the Internet this week because uh, I hate it. Um, and I mean, it got me. It made me laugh. But I hate well, that. there was just whenever um, jerpy. The Jerpy, uh, Cooper Jerpy, uh, Cooper Jerpy, uh, <laughs> left and right. It was uh, the Cardinals have herpes, you know. OK, and, yeah. Um, and it I sounds like a fish to me. I can't believe they haven't dropped the H at this point. You yeah. know, it's a rough, silent H. <laughs> what, what, by they, do you mean the Jerpies? Yes. OK, the Jerpy clan. You you. OK, yeah. well. Maybe, you know, when he gets to the big leagues, he'll do that. Yeah. Well, at this point, yeah, I think it's too late. There's yeah. no no medication for the, for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say you weren't going to do that? I know. Damn it. I was about Liar. to say that. I, I broke Liar. my own rules. Um, hey, Ben, hey, you I, know, uh, this is another tab after dark. So this is this is what happens. Is, it it, it yeah. gets blue. It's a little it's a little it's nasty. A little, yeah. Wow. Um, well, quite the opposite, Ben. I watched, uh, the Sandlot. The hey, other day. okay. Yeah. Um, we do a weekly movie night with our, uh, with our five-year-old daughter and I've been holding on to this one. We kind of go through a rotation. We watch stuff that, you know, we know is going to be appealing to her that she gets a pick. And then we also do like you know, I pick one from that. I loved as a kid and Molly will do the same and whatnot. And so I've been holding on to Sandlot waiting until she was a little bit older and we finally watched it. Um, you know, this was like my favorite movie. As oh a yeah. Kid. I, I think, yeah, I know you and I, how many I, times I, do you think I would you watch it. I, I would maybe need to think about this a little bit longer, but I think it might be my favorite baseball movie. Like it, and it holds up. It's still great. I think it is too, you know, and it's obviously a little bit different than most of the like, you know, adult based <laughs> baseball movies where baseball actually plays like the game of baseball plays a little bit ma- a bigger role. But like, it's a it's a great movie. I was a little worried that it wouldn't hold up, you know, because I, I have not seen it since. Right. I don't know. Eleven or something. Um, but it really holds up. It was really enjoyable. It's it's more of like a slice of life film, you know, like yeah. at least like thinking back on on that movie, you know, it's all about trying to get the ball back, you know, and, and that's actually like the last half hour of the movie. The first it's an hour and 41 minutes long, which also blew my mind. Yeah, um, it's mostly just these little vignettes of all those iconic scenes that we remember, you know, the um, s'mores and them playing the like the actual little league team and smoking yeah. them and then going and eating the, uh, the chew and puking the all chewing over chewing tobacco scene yeah. is something that will never leave my mind. Yes. That is like, I, I even avoided those types of rides as a boy because I was like, I don't care if you have chewing tobacco or not. I'm not getting on that thing. Yeah. I'm going to vomit all over myself. Right. All over all the kids that are around yes. you. Um, the iconic scene that, uh, you know, still, works because it's a movie from the 90s emulating a time from the 50s you know or the 60s but um i think it's 1962 but where um 
the kid pretends to be drowning so he can oh, yeah. <laughs> uh kiss the windy cute peppercorn. Yes. Yeah. Oh, windy peppercorn. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Peppercorn. Peppercorn. Not peppercorn? Yeah. I'm last pretty name. sure I'd it's rather... peppercorn. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because he caught me off guard too. I was like, peppercorn. Huh. Well, um, yeah, great movie. The only, uh, I also remember when I think of that movie, I, I think of the vignettes you're talking about. And I remember the dog being so scary. What, uh, was it, it's named yeah. like Goliath or something like that. Uh, I can't remember, but Hercules, the dog Hercules, was, yeah, yeah. um, Lola was legit terrified. Like yeah, he's scary. Yeah. He's ripping his chain out of the wall or whatever. Like that's that's scary stuff. The amount of time he flings contraptions straight up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> what is the uh not connects? They had a uh what's what's those toys that you would build, those metal toys that come erector with, set. like yeah. erector sets, yes. Yeah. Never had an erector set growing up. I always wanted one. Maybe that's why I, I did am this way. Yeah. Wow. I did have nice. one. Yeah. But I don't feel like I ever truly. I imagine that that would be a very difficult toy for somebody um, like you. <laughs> yeah, me not think too smart. Um, <laughs> I mostly had uh, Legos, you know, and I think yeah. that that was a little bit, uh, you know, easier. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> to, uh... <laughs> they come with nice, colorful instructions. Well, they, they just click together, you know, yeah. like screws and bolts yeah. and things. Yeah. 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 Um, too much. Yeah, it was good. Um, I, I really enjoyed watching it like end to end. It was an enjoyable film and I'm, and I'm glad that to have watched it again. I, I was like, is this just going to be a, a relic of my childhood? And I really right. tried to go in, uh, n- you know, not nostalgia. Like, is this still a fun movie? Through the lens of kids, you know, it's not right. it's not for adults, but like even with that, um, it was fun and it it definitely like all the Babe Ruth stuff, like it mm-hmm. was nice, you know. I enjoyed it. Um the other one I was thinking about from that time that is probably doesn't hold up as well because it was more of a straight comedy, but rookie of the year, I think we're gonna oh, yeah. watch again soon. Um I, I'll be interested to see if that one holds up as well as uh as Sandlot did. I, I remember enjoying it, but thinking it was kind of dumb as a child. So yeah. I would be very shocked. Like I, I remember having a thought as a boy thinking like, well, there's absolutely no way that somebody's arm would heal like that. People would be out breaking <laughs> their arms all the time, trying to become baseball players at the age of 13 and having a problem with that. That being said, John Candy as a baseball announcer is the best casting of any role of all time. So that part will probably still be very funny. Yeah. Uh, Gary Busey (laughs) is the the pitching coach, right? I feel like he shouldn't be around children, but I guess it was on the set. So (laughs) this is a different time. It's the midnight. Different time. Yeah, different time. (laughs) We didn't know. We didn't know yet. Sure. Sure. Uh, But yeah, so, you know, if you're out there thinking like, does the sandlot still hold up let me <laughs> let me tell you i did the reporting i did the work for you and um yeah it was good hey that's the talking about birds guarantee right there nate that's, will watch a movie that's right and i will talk <laughs> about it yeah uh so besides that um you know we had a a pretty uneventful week of cardinal baseball because there was very little of it but we did get uh, the all-star game and home run derby, which was a ton of fun. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure everybody is on the edge of their seat waiting to hear, uh, the results of our little game that we played last week. <laughs> we decided that we would do a, a draft for the, for the home run derby and we do it in the discord we did, and then we also decided in the moment while we were doing that, we could do in, involve other people in the Discord. So before we actually talk about the Derby, I just have to, you know, get these yeah. results yep. out because I'm yep. assuming we, this yep. is, yeah, this is what people came to this show for. So, um, so the way we did it is, uh, Ben and I randomly selected who would go first, and then who got whoever had the first overall pick, we did snake style. So Ben got the first pick. He picked one person, then I picked two, then he picked two, then I picked two, then he got the last one. Snake. Um, 
It was a snake. Style. It was a silly. It was a silly little snake draft. A slithery and, uh, little snake. The teams ended up. Uh, Ben's team was Pete Alonso, uh, Acuna, yeah. uh, Jose Ramirez, and Pools. Yeah. And yeah. I had Soto, Schwarber, Seager, and J Rod. So yeah. you can probably tell where this is going. You got one point per home run hit across the whole thing, and then ten points if you pick the winner. So uh, I smoked. <laughs> um, j-rod was a good choice <laughs> j-rod was a very good he choice was a very good choice uh so my total score ended up being 188 points uh to uh, bin's uh, 114 points oh that's the so, first time i've heard it that's that's bad yeah that's well, i mean who I, I obviously you selected j-rod um but who saw him hitting 60 what 63 home runs in the first two rounds that was incredible also that was my first time really watching him for like an extended period in what like unbelievably impressive human being yes superstar i think i said to mary while we were watching it this kid has the it factor whatever that is and however that translates to baseball on the field i don't know but the kid is a star yeah I have watched a lot of his at bats this year because I am a uh, fantasy baseball nerd and I have him in in our like main league and I just really like to watch that stuff. So I've watched a lot of his at bats, but you, his personality doesn't come out in single game at bats and all the interviews is great. What you know, he he didn't win, but it felt like he won the night. You know, it, it was definitely his night. Yeah, he he yeah. he sh- he came out to the world that evening for sure. Yeah. And it, it was so funny, too, because, you know, it's like he got beat by the grizzled veteran of Juan Soto, who's <laughs> 23 years old. And we're going to talk all this... about Juan Soto later. Oh, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. They said this on the broadcast. They said if because uh, it came down to J-Rod and Juan Soto, they said that, you know, J-Rod won. He was going to be the youngest winner ever. And if Soto won, he was going to be the second youngest winner, ever, yeah. which is crazy. Was great. Also, I think it speaks to the uh, young man's gameness of the home run derby especially this new format where like i mean we saw like Pujols looked he was asking for the theragun for his forearm mid like mid round like it is it's just not a game for old men but you know what he did so much better than i expected like i think the story the main story of the night was julio rodriguez after that was juan soto winning it and then after that was Pujols. uh you know, he he gets, um, what was it, 13 in the first part of the first round. Yeah. They get that little break where they have 30 seconds, uh, you know, and he he walks over to fucking get an oxygen tank. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, he gets surrounded by the entire group. Uh, what an awesome moment. And it's pretty and, you know, special. We learned, yeah. We learned mid home run derby that that was all impromptu yeah uh there's actually a scene in uh sandlot where uh once they find out that the ball that they hit over the wall was signed by babe ruth uh they all surround him and start you know uh waving their hats at him to give yeah. him air yeah. they were doing the exact <laughs> same thing to yeah. pool holes after the first two minutes uh and then he goes back out there you know schwarber uh a lot of people picked to win he ties him we get that bonus round which was so funny Pujols looked one part like he was really happy and super excited to to still be doing this and I think like three parts like oh my god just let me like <laughs> what do you want from me this is I I should have been I shouldn't even be here but yeah. I couldn't turn it down because I'm having it's Pujols' wild ride this last season where he's just having the most fun apparently of his entire life I mean, and, he, uh, the, the smile that he had on his face in the bonus round of the first round it was like he could barely keep himself together to hit the ball yeah. it was you know we've talked already this season about how any other time we've ever watched Pujols be on the Cardinals, if you saw him smile, it was very rare and it's just yeah. infectious. It's so it's so much fun. Yeah. I mean, we were glued, you know, glued to the, yeah. the TV that night. And he somehow hits 20, even yeah. though not a single one of them went the 440 feet. So yes. it's just laser shots left and right. And, uh, you know, it, it, and Schwarber uh, choke job, whatever you want to call it. He's still, you know, like, Pools at 20. So it's not like it was nothing, right? It wasn't like right. seven to five. Like Schwarber 
had more than some of the other guys who competed uh, when it was all said and done. But, um, you know, he was funny about it, like, fa- you know, bowing. I'm not to, worthy. I'm not worthy. Yeah. yeah was, he had yeah, a great was, attitude about it. Yeah. And I have and to the, imagine if you're Schwarber, if you lose to anybody, like, you can go home and sleep fine knowing that you lost to Albert Pools, even though he's in his 40s. Like, yeah, it's it's more fun. It's right. like, you know, at least Schwarber can walk away being like, well, that's like what we're here for. That's right. It's fun that Pujols won. And again, it's not like Schwarber like completely tanked, you know, like Jose Ramirez only hit what, like 16 and a bunch of guys were in those mid teens ranges. And then Pujols had a pretty respectable second round as well. Um, And, you know, there was, it looked like a little bit that at the, at the beginning Soto was struggling. And I was like, Oh yeah, no way. No way. He hadn't found the groove yet. And, I looked over at Mary and I was like, if, if Pujols goes to the the final round, he's not going to make it. They're going to. Yeah, he's going to have to tap out. I don't like like I said, he had the Theragun. He was asking his kids <laughs> for water. All you know, all the National League players are surrounding him. I don't know if he could have kept going, but um, that, yeah. that might have been one. of You know, we were talking about this before it started. Like it, this might be one of the best home run derbies of all time. And I think it pretty much li- uh, lived up to it. Like, I, yeah. I guess there could have been a little more drama, but. Like everything, like you have the old superstar showing up and showing out. You have the young kid nobody's heard of yet doing amazing things. You have Juan Soto, one of the best hitters in the game, winning it. Like what else yeah. can you ask for? Like it was incredible. I I don't know that we'll be able to get that exact recipe again, unless maybe they get Cabrera in it next year or something like that. But even yeah. still, it's not exactly the same. Uh, Cabrera is absolutely first ball. It should be unanimous yeah. Hall of Fame. But Pujols is, you know, it's a different level. It's inner circle. You yeah. know, it, it, everyone who's listening is a Cardinals fan. Right. So I don't need to go too deep, but like, we're probably I, not going to get something exactly like this again. I do think that's an interesting point to make, though, and something that not, not that you need to put down Miguel Cabrera when you're talking about Albert Pujols, but more to just put like what Pujols has put together and what he's meant in into context a little bit more is like Miguel Cabrera is incredible. And there are stories about him that make him sound like this mythical being of baseball hitting. And then you look at the numbers in the career and Pujols is easily been more productive and it is definitely an inner circle hall of famer. And, and Miguel Cabrera is a hall of famer, no doubt, like you said, but Pujols is just a step. It's above, just different. Which it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what a, what a fun, what a fun night. And, um, you know, outside of the competition that Ben and I did um, where I smoked him, uh, we <laughs> oh, also yeah. Yeah. we also did a we did one in the discord uh, with a couple of people, um, you know, in in the discord. We did the draft same sort of system. And so shout out to the bird scored uh, for participating. It was a ton Retweet. of fun. And, uh, you know, if it makes you feel better ben you did win this one thank you it was narrow um but uh it turns out picking julio rodriguez was the key <laughs> yeah. for both of us <laughs> so uh you had a uh you barely beat though uh jobo who had uh who picked juan soto so yeah. um but the just the sheer volume of home runs that uh that Julio put up in those uh, in his three rounds, put it over the edge. Um, I think the only other thing to talk about with the home run derby is it's time to make fun of our favorite guy to make fun of, you know, him, (laughs) you love him. He's a big, tough guy himself. Pete Alonzo. Uh, Before we go too deep, I will say uh, it's, he was definitely a victim of the J rod show because uh, the second round he hit 23 home runs. That was actually the most home runs he had hit in a second round in of the week of all of his home run derbies. Uh, so he just ran into the buzzsaw. That was, was the J rod show. It, you know, it's not like he choked. He did better than he'd ever done in the second round. And uh, he just wasn't beating uh, Julio's 30 home runs or whatever. But um, what a difference it was where you'd see, uh, you know, Pujols, Soto, Julio, all of the guys out there, just having a blast and you got Alonzo like 
mouth breathing down in the in the dugout or whatever he was doing like i don't want to discount or i don't want to knock someone for meditating i think that's a very healthy and, and great thing to do but it, the the dichotomy of what was going on yes. on the field with what alonzo was doing was pretty startling i, I think the self-serious nature of it, yeah. it, it however that is illustrating itself i you know if you're if you're lifting weights, if you're meditating, if you're if you're in your mind and you're you're just thinking, you're visualizing, that's all fine. Do it however you want to do it. But like the fact that the camera was there and it felt from my point of view, like he was maybe playing that up for the camera or doing a little bit of you don't even know. I haven't even even begun to peek at the home run derby. <laughs> I'm about to hit 50 home runs in this round. I am a golden god to steal from Dennis and it's always sunny, but like yeah. the, 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 I, I think you nailed it. If I, if maybe one other guy in the Derby was sitting there and he's taking it seriously and maybe he's, you know, he's making mean gestures at other players and he, they're playing up this heel angle or something like that. And we're having fun with it. It's probably all fine and dandy, but he looked like a psychopath a little bit. Like <laughs> he just like, <laughs> Which is also weird because we watched him last year at, in in Colorado in a uh, in Mile High, and he is there was a, if you remember there was a fan that took a ball off the face or the chest or something like that, and they kind of stopped everything down to make sure that person was still breathing and and all that because I, I think it was a younger person that took it off the chest, and um, I don't think Pete really knew what was going on, but he's you know they're playing some hip I think they're playing Beastie Boys or, or Run DMC or some old school hip hop, and he was kind of bouncing to the music, getting the crowd into it, bopping and all that and having a great yeah. time. And he put on a performance that is, was not incredible. And then yeah. this time, I don't know. It's like something happened to him. Like, did he, did he like a, like a witch doctor cursed him or something like that? <laughs> Very strange. Probably, probably a witch doctor. <laughs> you know, I, that you got to look out for that these days. The world's crazy. <laughs> it really um, is. Yeah. No, well, he did do that interview where he spoke pretty, heavily about the charity that he started so we're, we're really trying yes. not to make fun of him too much here because again do do your thing but the just the vibe was very strange compared to what was happening with everyone else but i'm wondering it you know he he kept talking about he's doing this for something more than himself it's a bigger purpose you know and and that's great of course it is you know love that he's doing right. it for it was i think it was kids and shelter animals like oh two of two of the best causes you could have you know so absolutely but I, I don't know, maybe that got in in his head and, you know, he was like, I, I can't be having fun when I'm up here earning money for kittens. And, and, and you know what? I'm totally aligned with that. And I think he did a good job of kind of, you know, talking about that, making a point. But why don't you make it s seem like it's a fun thing to be a part of? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I bet if Pete could redo that, he'd redo it and he he wouldn't be where he was deadlifting 130 pounds. Yeah. And, grunting in the very well equipped gym underneath that was a good looking Dodger gym. stadium it was nice yeah um I, I will say the the angle we got of soto just laying on his back jamming the theragun thing into his back was an angle <laughs> you don't get a lot uh for <laughs> for just people in general sort well, of like yeah. a crotch level angle of <laughs> someone <laughs> really seeing how the sausage is made <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah, the home home run derby. We talked about it last week a ton. Like that, they they finally figured it out, and they have, uh, yeah, and it's great. And uh, they should oh. make it available everywhere. By the way, uh, it's oh, dumb yeah. for the MLB to to limit it to ESPN. I know ESPN is huge, but still, like this should be blasted. It should be on the MLB TV app. It should be free on YouTube. It should be yeah. everywhere. Like this is the one thing people who don't know anything about baseball know is they know home runs and they found a format that's fun. They got young stars that are having fun. Put it everywhere. That's how you bring more people into the game. But anyway, well, there's yeah. I, first off, 100 percent. It should just be everywhere um, all over the world. Everyone should be watching that because it's such a fun event. And you see personalities. We're talking about Julio and, you know, getting to know him and, and, and just seeing people be themselves and Albert, you know, kind of break the shell. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about before we move on, and I think you missed this because I know you were you were kind of trying to figure out your that problem that you were talking about, like, how the hell do I watch this thing if I'm not a cable person? Um, 
But uh, yeah, when they annoying. were calling out the players, you know, they call out the players through these like big TVs and they're blowing smoke and ooh, ooh, Kyle Schwarber's here. Everybody's losing their minds. And uh, what happened was that all of the uh, uh, all eight contestants were on the stage and there were some pyrotechnics that were going off behind them and the stage wasn't that big. And Ronald Acuna Jr. and Jose Ramirez were like, you could see them. They were visibly afraid of the pyrotechnics because I think they were very large and very close. And every time <laughs> they happened, Ronald Acuna kept grabbing in the back of his neck and being like, oh, my God, it's so hot. So seeing him like kind of trying to look serious and mean mug at the TV a little bit. And then the pyrotechnics go off and he kind of jumps up ahead and he's like, what the hell are they doing to me? Was a, yeah. a personal highlight for me. Um, that sparked pretty funny. a ton of joy. Yeah. Well, he's another guy like, you know, the, the, I guess the downside of the format is once he was done, he's done, you know, right. but like, um, it's just such a stacked lineup that like somehow Ronald Acuna Jr. And Jose Ramirez were like, afterthoughts of the event yeah. when they are two of the best players in the game and two of the most exciting players in the game two top five players probably yeah yeah if you're yeah. starting a team right now um you you maybe go with like a juan soto um or a julio but like right after that you're looking at uh ronald cooney jr or or even a jose ramirez who's a little yeah. bit older but i mean you know he's on a hall of fame pace himself and yeah and you know, Acuna is too young to really know, but like these are guys that are like the future of of baseball. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the All Star Game. Uh, what was your uh, What was your take on the All Star Game? The All Star Game is fun. Um, it is definitely second fiddle to the Derby, as we've kind of been talking about. I think that this one was particularly crisp um, in that it had a good pace to it. It was moving. Um, now, part of that was the National League team didn't have a hit for about seven innings straight or something like yeah. that. So that's a little lame. But obviously, like seeing some of these arms that came out of the AL bullpen were was a lot of fun. Um, you know, my the Cardinals fans highlights, I, I think, are, are pretty obvious. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt taking Shane McClanahan deep. I mean, deep too. Yeah, like that was yeah. That was awesome. That, that was rose up. That was right in the power alley. He destroyed that ball. And I think that, you know, I felt a little vindication. And I'm sure Paul did too. After Shane McClanahan did what he did to the Cardinals. What was that? Two, three weeks ago or so. He yeah. basically blanked him over nine or, or eight innings and looked like the best pitcher in baseball, which he might be, or he's, he's up there in that close top three, to it. Top five. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was incredible. Um, I know there's some complaining about him getting taken out right after he hit the home run, but I say, Hey, you show up, you hit a home run in the first inning, take the rest <laughs> of the day off. What the hell else do you need to do? Like you did your work. Yeah. Yeah. Don't wear yeah. out my first baseman. I'm fine with that. Yeah. I, you know, as a Cardinal fan, I think it's fair criticism. You know, we want to see our guys. Michaelis has now been in two all-star games and has never yeah. gotten to pitch. Uh, you know, uh, Goldschmidt's the, I think at this point, clear front runner for uh mvp and he gets one at bat you know like i get it why people are frustrated but um you know it is what it is i, I wasn't too yeah. too worried about it um you got to see I, I, helsley though I, I was just gonna yeah i, I was gonna say that the, take paulie out and then helsley's performance was i know he gave up a pretty solid hit on that curveball that went middle middle um but you know, there's a point in the broadcast where Helsley throw it's it's 103 on the black, like uh, uh, outside to a left hander. And Joe Davis, the the announcer for the Dodgers and the announcer for the uh, All Star Game, just goes wow, like yeah. he couldn't even say anything. <laughs> and it was it was you know we've seen Helsley; he's been unbelievably dominant all year. And we see some days he has that 98, 99, and then some days he's hitting 101, 102, 103. And I don't know there's probably a marketable difference if you're standing there, but watching it on TV, when you see that one Oh three and, and there is something about with the way the fastball comes out of his hand, he looks like a robot. It's, and yeah. um, I, I thought it was pretty cool for him to be not only having the unbelievable, I think he's given up three runs this year to have the year he's having, but then to be able to kind of show off in Do front it. of yeah. the, uh, that crowd and that stadium and that, just that arena, I think, is really good. We were talking about this last week about how, like, I don't really get jazzed up for guys like Nolan making the all star team and stuff like that. But I do 
you know, when it's a kid like Helsley and his whole story and the injuries and everything in his season he's having, that's exactly what I wanted to see that that filled my bucket up. And I was I was just yeah very happy and 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 cheering along. Well, it also, I think, uh, really highlights what I think the all star game has become, which is basically just a showcase of uh, major league bullpens at this point, <laughs> yeah. especially later when you're going like back to back to back against like the best yeah. closers in the game. Uh, you know, it's, it's feels like every all-star game just going forward is going to be like a two to one, three to two, you know, someone's going to get to someone early and then you just bring in all the closers who are all used to coming in out of the bullpen. You know, you got these starters who are coming in out of their routine, out of their normal situation, Maybe it doesn't go the way that they're used to. But once you start getting into the closers, it's like, what are we even doing here? We've got yeah. all of the best arms in baseball together. It's I and I, I I'm not complaining. You know, I, uh, I I think that is cool to see that. Um, well, and, and Helsley fit right in on that. I was just going to ask you about that. Like, obviously, I think there's two main camps around the all star game. And one of the camps is what you're talking about is let's showcase the all stars. Let's get everybody in a B or two. Um, let the stars be out, you know, do their thing. Have, have uh, there, there was a lot of interviews in this game. Some of them were good. Some of them were not so good. Are, are you, are, would you ra- prefer that? Or would you prefer it's, it's Shane McClanahan, Sandy Alcantara. They both go to 90 or hundred pitches. You're having your a plus lineup out there. Um, and then, you know, obviously uh, swapping people out for advantageous situations like you would in a normal game. If you were the king of baseball or the all-star game for a day, which rule set would you impose? That's an interesting question because I think like as a, a true fan of like the game of baseball, let alone like the allegiance to different players and teams and whatnot, like having a legitimate matchup between like two star studded teams where it is managed like a real game and all that I think would be very, very compelling. Um, but one single game of baseball is such a, 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 you know, an exercise in random outcomes, right? right? That like, no matter how competitive it is, everything could be shrugged away with like, it's only one game. Right. And so I think with that being said, and with what I think the all-star game should be, which is a celebration of the, um, of the sport and the stars, both the, uh, legendary players and then up and coming players. Um, I would rather it, I think the, the right thing is the, is the showcase the, you know, everyone's getting an AB and that's, what's been weird about it too, where it's been kind of stuck in between at times. Like, Goldie's out after the first inning, whatever, that's fine. But like Acuna is in there for, you know, three at bats and for most of the game, but certainly there was an outfielder in the bench who never got a shot, you know? So it's like, I'd rather it be like, we're straight up doing like everyone gets an at bat and every, like everyone's getting in the game because you know, whatever, uh, or it's, we're going to actually try to win. It's this like middle ground where it can be kind of a bummer that you know like some of your guys didn't get in obviously pitching is going to be difficult because there's only nine innings but like i don't know i guess i'm kind of circling yeah. around the, the answer well, here. Yeah, but I th- and, and, and i think you could make ju- you know acuna played a lot freddie freeman played a lot the manager was brian snicker like it's probably something to that you know that maybe those guys came up and said i want this many at bats we also maybe paulie said i want one at bat and then i'll be done yeah. and freddie can come in or whoever else can come in i mean obviously yeah. you know, conversations were well, not privy to Acuna and Freeman, we were just talking about Acuna and Freeman, like two of the biggest stars in the game. So like, yeah. it's fine that they're in there for a long time, but it is always a little confusing about like, what, where's that decision making yeah. coming from? And it is probably just like you said, it was Snitker and, you know, he's got his guys and they just won the World Series. And those two were um, or at least Freeman was a, you know, a major part of of that World Series. So why not? Why not have him out there all the time? And he's a Dodger now and it's in Dodger stadium. So I'll give him, you know, yeah. Freeman, you know, let him play. And, 
you know, if he didn't play enough, he might have cried after the game. And <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, L- no, low hanging fruit. Somebody no had to crying say. in baseball. Yeah. Speaking of <laughs> baseball movies, no, we're we're pro crying. This is a pro are, crying in yeah. baseball podcast. M- show you care. You know, show you people care. show people show they care in different ways. Um, so yeah, I, I, overall though, you know, I think the Derby was the star and and the all-star game was fine and fun. And I don't really know what they could do to improve it. Like, I guess going back to making it matter, but not in the way that they made it matter before. I, I, I wish I I don't have a suggestion here. You know, I don't know how you could make the players care about it in a way that isn't, that is still ambivalent to the, or not, uh, doesn't impact the actual game, you know? Right. I, I think, I think what we should do, and I'll go on a little tiny tangent here is that accept the all-star game for what it is. Uh, and then look towards the WBC, which is coming back. Mike yes. Trout has already stated that he's going to be starting. He's going to be the captain. He's going to be the center fielder. Um, and I'm hoping that Mike Trout joining means that a wave of American players and hopefully players from all over the world are going to be motivated to join in the WBC. And we all get really jazzed up about that. And that obviously that's not going to be national league versus American league, but it becomes a thing where yeah. the best American players, the best Dominican players, the best Japanese players, you know, the best players from every respective country that's in the WBC are represented. And that, I mean, last time that came around, it didn't have all the stars, but it had a lot of stars. And there are some moments that I still think about the Adam Jones catch in center field, the uh, Javi right. Baez and uh, and uh, Yadier Molina relationship that kind of happened during that WBC. Like, let's you know, I, I give all or give Trout all the credit. I, I really hope he starts a wave where we have an awesome, maybe the best WBC yet with him kind of being the the main cheerleader main main kind of rah rah guy for that to happen. I mean, you can't get a better personality to lead a team than Mike Trout, you know. <laughs> He's yeah. really that kind of guy that people just want to play for. Yeah. Uh, but but I agree that, like that, that charisma that he carries. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um I bet his favorite food is bread. Um <laughs> toasted bread. Toasted, toasted bread. bread. You got to get that toast. Um Yeah, but I like the World Baseball Classic ex- is exactly yeah, good call. That's what I mean. Like you want to see these like great players that are actually playing the game to win and you get a, a full series, which is right. what baseball is really about. That's why like one game where they they really care, like you can just hand wave away basically any outcome. Sure. But if you get a full series, you can actually see it. Um, and hey, you know, maybe we'll get Yachty down there kicking basketballs. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Did, did not have that on my 2022 bingo <laughs> card. Am I right? <laughs> what a weird yeah getting weird ejected from a puerto story. rican basketball game in the middle yeah. of the baseball season what what's he doing i i, I really i i don't know i've avoided there's all these talks about yachty and what's he actually doing i i i give him the benefit of the doubt end to yes. end but it's fair <laughs> i gotta say yeah him like <laughs> showing up with his looking tight you know looking yep. fresh he's got oh, yeah. the mess he's got the messenger bag looking like one of the richest people in puerto rico screaming and hugging the referee at like the same time like yeah. this is a weird this is, i was like all right what is going on get, yeah. get back up here we need it we, <laughs> Yvonne and Kisner, we yeah. need you. All right. So, uh, Yachty's daily outfit costs more than my truck. <laughs> yeah, for sure. He's insane. Yeah, for sure. He keeps it fresh. But, um, again, I, I, you know, I, whatever. That's Yachty. I, I, I'm with you. And I think that's the right move. Trust in Yachty. I mean, what what else is there to say? I think the guy yeah. knows what he's doing. And obviously, yeah. there's something going on. And maybe we'll hear about it. Maybe we won't. But yeah. I trust in Yachty. Yeah, so um, let's move on. Uh, we've just spent a long time talking about the the home run derby and the all star yeah. break. Um, but we have some actual Talk about some real baseball, some real baseball. So we've got some. Uh, there has been some cardinal, uh, you know, news over the last few days. Uh, talking about the the home run derby and, and Juan Soto this is what everyone's talking about at this point. Like what a weird cloud to have over his head. You know, you've got, he's hover handing 
Scott Boris through the whole <laughs> uh, <laughs> through the whole press conference because he has to be there to like fend off any weird questions and a question it, for you. Yeah. Do you have to be the most obnoxious person on earth to be a good agent or does that just kind of is that kind of how it is or is it is it a like how does that relationship exist? Do you, is it required to be successful in that role? Uh, well, I think yeah, I think yes. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think that like it also attracts that type of personality. Sure. You yeah. know what I mean? It, it's it's self fulfilling. You have to be like needle every angle to be a really good agent and be a really good lawyer, which is essentially what they are, you know? Um, so you have to be comfortable angling everything, going for every advantage, going for everything. And, and a lot of people are not comfortable doing that. And so the ones that are the best at it is like, why are you this way? Um, that said, you know, the evolution of the, of, of, uh, the, at least my, and I think a lot of people like me, the evolution of our opinion of Scott Boris has been really interesting over the last like 15 years. Cause there was a point in, uh, not that long ago where Scott Boris had been labeled as like the villain of, sure. uh, of baseball, you know? And, um, I think the, you know, the more that I want to eat the rich, the more I understand that while he is a very rich man, he actually is, very very good for the players and very he he's incredibly successful because he actually has done a great job at lobbying for the players and moving like the players experience forward so i actually really yeah. like what scott boris has done even if he is an obnoxious uh yeah. person yeah and, and i think more generally he is pro worker which yeah. i think exactly you know, i i know us two uh are are, are fully aligned on um, well, it, it's he's just got, like insane compounds. He's, you know, yes. he's doing a lot that like actually help the players. Um, I think he's a net good for the sport. And it's just yeah. been crazy to see the he was like the bad guy forever because we were all brainwashed by the owners. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God forbid the Steinbrenners have to pay somebody. <laughs> yeah. Right. I was just yeah. reading. Oh, my God. Real quick tangent. I was just reading that uh, George Steinbrenner's initial personal investment in the Yankees back in the uh, I think it was the uh, uh, the early 70s was seven hundred thousand dollars. He turned seven hundred thousand dollars into I think that the Yankees are valued at over five billion right now. Um, yeah, but Ben, you no, don't no understand <laughs> that money's not liquid. Okay. Yeah. Like if you actually, it's not actually a profit making organization. Sure, of course. And listen, sure. Bill DeWitt bought a $12 million uh, mansion right in the middle of the pandemic, but he's not making any money off of baseball. Of course. Yeah. No, no. He just inherited it all from his father. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, let's this is tab after dark. We can we'll get uh, <laughs> we'll get ranty here. But um, yeah, a- anyway, so let's so OK, we're talking about Soto. Yeah. Well, to center ourselves a little bit more, <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, if you have been living under a rock or just not paying attention, Soto was offered four hundred and forty million dollars from the Nationals over 15 years, which I think comes up to about twenty nine million dollars a year give or take a million here or there. Um, Soto said, no, the nationals put him on blast a la Brian Cashman and the Yankees with Aaron judge, which seems to be a new move. Like, Hey guys, we tried to pay him. This is a lot of money. We're talking almost half a billion dollars. Um, But then really when you hear it, when you hear, Oh, Juan Soto getting paid almost 30 million, that's not really near the top of the market anymore. That's not really his worth. So while I think it does sound insane. And I, if any, if I was in a Juan Soto shoes, I would just say yes, because that's, guaranteed for almost a half million. a billion dollars. I just yeah. don't know how he's, but that being said, it's his prerogative. And that is, that is a part of why baseball is awesome. And free agency is awesome. And why these players, yeah. these players should be valued. These players should make more money than anyone else in the sport. Um, maybe not more than anyone else in the world, but uh, <laughs> as far as the sport of baseball is concerned, they are the most valuable commodity and they should be treated. So, um, so anyways, what that means, uh, or I guess I'll try to summate this this whole situation as quickly as I can. The Lerner family, who currently owns the Nationals, basically what happened is they won their World Series. 
They are looking at the landscape of baseball and pretty much every team is worth a billion dollars plus right now. Um, I think that might be true. I might be pulling that out of my butt, but the nationals in their market are definitely valued at over a billion. How much over a billion? I don't know. The learner family is deciding to sell. Uh, Juan Soto is basically saying, I don't really want, I, I know the learners. I don't know this, who these new owners are going to be. Um, and the learners are kind of making the de- decision that um, they want to make a decision on their most valuable asset before that team is sold, um, which is some billionaire shit that I'm never going to understand or even <laughs> pretend to understand. Yeah. Um, because my personal thought is if you have a Juan Soto, you keep them. Um, right. But that being said, if you don't want to keep Juan Soto, the best time to trade him is immediately because his value right. only goes down on the free market. So all that to be said, the Cardinals are believed to be players. Um, and I think I don't want to speak for you, Nate, but I think the main reason that is, is because of our high end prospects and what the yeah. Cardinals have at the top of their system lines up with acquiring a Soto type player, a generational type generational, talent. Yeah. Yeah. Who is 23. Yeah. It'd be kind of like trading for Pujols when he was 23. It's, you know, we don't know the trajectory of, of, of Soto's career. We, you know, you truly, you know, well, we won't know until it's done, but like the types of numbers that he is putting up in the, in, in the projections on him is kind of like if you could trade for Pujols in like 2004. Right. So, um, huge opportunity and i think it is like you said the cardinals are no almost everywhere you look the cardinals are outside of betting odds which i think is interesting it's like all the all the writers and pundits and whatnot are putting the cardinals as the number one most likely team and then like betting odds have you know yankees and mets and some of these other teams like that is the number one likely team but either way cardinals are are way up there and and i think you're right and i think it mostly comes down to writers and and whatnot need to put together content they need to project who's the most likely to trade they look around and they see the cardinals have a jordan walker they have a mason win um you know a liberator zach thompson a bunch of these guys that have been top level prospects that are either in the MLB now or are near MLB, which is exactly what the nationals have said they want to acquire in a trade for Soto. And it's just obvious. It makes sense. It's an easy article to write. And as long as the Cardinals have these prospects, we have to get used to being linked to every single possible trade uh, anywhere, because it's just the easy thing to put together. You could go, you could go and get, a lot of different people with a Jordan Walker in a trade offer or a Mason Wayne in a trade. I would argue that the Cardinals with their current prospect situation, minor league situation, they could go get anyone in baseball, right? I think they could get Mike Trout. Um, I think that they could get anyone if parties are interested in in all that. They're willing to do it. Yeah. Right. And, And so I think we just as Cardinal fans have to get ready to be linked to every possible trade offer. Like anybody that goes on the market, it's gonna be like, oh, the Cardinals are a good fit. Um, when because when you also pair that with the fact that it's the same problem the Cardinals always have, which is that we have no bad players, but only a handful of really, really good players. So, like, there's a ton of upgradable spots whenever these elite or near elite players go on the market. Um, so Juan Soto, obviously, he's every team should want Juan Soto. Uh, he he instantly improves any team by multiple degrees. And the Cardinals outfield, we felt like was set, but with all the injuries and the uncertainty of Bader's injury, like there is kind of a hole in the outfield that Soto would be the best person to put into there, right? Yeah. So I get it. Everything makes sense why you're seeing the Cardinals as the as this like obvious trade choice. That all said, I truly do not believe that this is going to happen. I, I don't. I and maybe I'm just stealing myself. I've learned, um, you know, the the Cardinals did trade for Arenado. They did trade for uh, Goldschmidt, but those were different. the The circumstances of their contracts were different. The trading partners were different. Like it just this is very different and we know how the Cardinal organization, how, how Mazalek and crew are very conservative when it comes to trading pr- for prospects and the things that we're hearing that the nationals are looking for 
I just don't see it happening. Now, well, I am all in on it happening. Yeah. Hell yeah. I truly, whatever package, I honestly, like, it would be a bummer to lose Jordan Walker. It'd be a bummer to lose Mason Wynn. It'd be a bummer to lose uh, Zach Thompson or whoever. But I don't care. It's Juan yeah. Soto. If if they will agree to a package, they the Cardinals should acquire Juan Soto. I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I, I And I think, and, and you know, I think everything you said is, you know, as, as as smart as you could put together on your own. Um, but I think I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I think that I, I I think that it is likely, uh, or, or I think that there is there's a less than a fifty percent chance, more than a ten percent chance. I'm going to take a big swath of that percentage in That's there. A huge, all right, <laughs> it is. But I do think that there is a chance, and I do think you know the, the good news is is that uh, it doesn't make sense for the Dodgers, um, or, or I don't yeah. see it for the Dodgers because they don't have the prospect package. Or if they did, they're they're uh, they would be a bit decimated. That being said, they seem to be able to uh, uh, produce prospects. Two like and no a half one years of Soto, though, for any prospects, like sure. we you know for every Julio Rodriguez, there's a Jared Kel- uh, Kelenic, right? right? So sure. it's like I don't know. I think it, it, the other good news is is I would bet a large, decently large sum of money that there is no way Juan Soto gets traded within the, in the division. And I think two teams that could absolutely use him are the Mets and the Braves. And I just think that that is not going to happen. Yeah. Owners are not going to approve that because of ownership things. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the most prudent baseball decision, but Owners are going to be owners and they're not going to want to see that. They're not going to want to do that. If you are buying the Nationals, you're not going to want to see Juan Soto in a Braves uniform uniform beating the shit out of your team for two and a half years or whenever that sale takes place. The only team that I that really or, or sorry, I'll, I'll say two teams that really make a lot of sense to me outside of the Cardinals. That's the Texas Rangers because they are rebuilding. They have been very aggressive in their free agent signing. They have a couple of prospects and they can absolutely take on money. So if, if that deal comes with Corbin Bur- or uh, not Corbin Burns, that'd be nice. Hey, um, yeah. uh, Patrick uh, Corbin, Patrick Corbin. Yeah, um, that that could make some sense to me. There's also a Boris relationship that exists there with they've just gave Boris what, like four hundred million dollars in the offseason and. Um, and I know that doesn't, uh, obviously the trade market is different, but Boris's influence, I think can't be ignored. Um, but I think really, if I were to put a, a, a team that's maybe above the Cardinals in likelihood, say the San Diego Padres, um, they've been hyper aggressive for like four or five years. Um, they have shown willingness to move prospects to get high end players and they have McKenzie Gore, CJ Abrams, uh, who would probably headline a package to get. Juan Soto. Uh, they also are, are win now. All that being said, I want to make my quick argument for the Cardinals without blabbering on forever, but the Cardinals are in win now. They have two Hall of Famers who are in their prime or, or aging out of their prime, so they're motivated to win now, uh, not to mention the Wainwright Pools and Yachty of it all. They have the prospects to make it happen, and we know exactly the, the cost is controlled. Obviously, he's going to go through a, arbitration, but you can reasonably project that he's making about twenty million right now. He'll get a decent raise next year. He'll get a decent raise next the year after that. The Cardinals have money coming off the books, um, and I think that when you're making this trade, the outfield logjam is irrelevant. The who's going to DH is irrelevant. Um, he is that player that pushes you over the edge. And now I want to caveat all that with being Juan Soto is not necessarily the hole that the Cardinals need to fill right now, but every right. single team in the league is better with Juan Soto. That is yeah. how good of a player he is. So to summate what I'm trying to say, I don't think the competition is going to be as aggressive as maybe it seems for a player of this caliber because of the what it's going to cost financially and prospect wise. Not just not all teams can swing that. And if Corbin right. is included in it as well, we were talking about this off off pod the other day. Corbin, uh, I keep wanting to say Corbin Burns. Patrick Corbin, who has had two awful years, two and a half awful years, um, including the Demi year, um, is making $60 million over the next two and a half seasons. Like I said, Juan Soto is projected to make probably in the mid-20s at the light least. So you're talking about potentially taking on you know, $50 million a season so that's some team's entire payroll and a lot of teams just aren't go- or they can of course they can cuz they're all re- 
you know, they all have more money than God, but they're not going to take on those te- uh, right. on, on those financials. So I don't know that that's where I'm sitting. I don't think it's impossible. Is it likely ish? I think probably he'll be a Padre. Um, I, I'll throw the Giants in there too. The pro- Giants probably don't have the prospects to get it done right now. Um, but yeah, that that's my two yeah. cents. Well, I hope that I'm this. This is rare, Ben. I hope that I'm wrong and you are right. I'm glad this um, is recorded. Yeah, uh, you can just uh, silo that, and you can just help, <laughs> it'll help you go to sleep or something. Thank I don't you. Know. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess I just I don't see it happening. But um, there's a there's a lot of things that line up for it to for it to happen if the Cardinals deem it it the right thing yeah. to do. Um, and hey, then yeah. we can lose every game seven to eight, uh, you know, <laughs> nine, nine to 10, because they will blow all of their resources on acquiring, uh, yeah, you know, and possibly trading starting pitching in order to get Juan Soto, uh, you know, when that is specifically what the Cardinals need right sure. now. But and, I mean, a, a lineup of Arenado, uh, uh, Goldschmidt and Soto is, like video game level absurd. Oh, yeah, yeah, the way I see it is, it would be Dylan, Paul, Soto, Arenado, Tyler. Uh, and, Assuming and I think, that one or two of those guys aren't involved in this trade, uh, O'Neill and uh, Carlson. I, yeah, I do think that there, there's probably one or two pieces from the big league team that are going, and then it's going to be a position player heavy. Uh, uh, send over to the Nats if it were to happen. Yeah. And if I had to guess, it'd be Libertor or uh, or Thompson, who you mentioned yeah. earlier. I, I think that it's probably one, two of those guys, and then a couple position players. Um, yeah. yeah. I did see something earlier. Um, you know, Corbin, this is not the type of guy that you would go out and get, but it could be okay. He had a four and a half FIP this year, and he's pitching in one of the, in front of one of the worst defenses in baseball. So, like, you know, four and a half FIP, obviously you're not looking for that when you're going to solve your rotation, but like there's a world where he's not just truly <laughs> trash for the St. Louis Cardinals like he has been for the <laughs> Washington Nationals. Nate, like um, four weeks ago, we were talking about the Cardinals should acquire Dallas Keuchel. Corbin is an upgrade for this current rotation. And, yeah, and it sucks. It's, it's a so, real problem. Yeah. Keuchel just got <laughs> DFA'd again by the Diamondbacks. So we have round, uh, go round get two. Him. Go, yeah, go get him. He can throw a ball he can. Uh, at a catcher, you know, so... All right. I don't know. I w- the, the the nice thing about this is that we're going to have an answer one way or another in the next two weeks. The trade yeah. deadline is July 31st. Yeah. So I, I'm uh, sure we'll talk about it next week, too. I, I feel like this is just going to dominate baseball until the trade deadline is over. Of course. Or Soto gets traded. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only other thing I'll add is that apparently the Cardinals are actually working on an offer. So this isn't just smoke. It's not, as I was saying, you know, it's a lot of writers, but it's not just that the Cardinals are actively engaged. So, yeah. uh, but if we know Mazalak, it's like, all right, how about Newt bar, uh, <laughs> Herrera and, uh, Tink hints for, for Juan Soto, you know, that's probably what they're yeah. starting at. I would love a I would love a, a a quantity over quality trade, but I'm not sure that that's going <laughs> to happen. Think, no, we'll right. give them half of the Triple A team. Yeah, sure. Paul DeYoung is available. Paulie's got to be in that trade. He's, he's got to get back to the bigs. He just won Player of the Week. He's he's got 47 RBI and 46 Let's games. Go. What they could they need that? Kid's a stud, Nate. Kid's a yeah. stud. Right. <laughs> we should keep him. Never mind. Don't trade him. <laughs> Damn it. I talked myself out of it. <laughs> All right. We got a few more things to talk about. But before we get to that, um, let's uh, remind everyone that if you've enjoyed this show and you want to support it, support its growth, uh, we do have a Patreon. Um, Patreon.com slash talking about birds. Subscribers at every level get access to the bird scored. You want to participate in future home run derby drafts and other nonsense that we do in there? Get in there. Uh, we unless you're we, scared. You know what? That's a good point. We haven't. We've only tried graciousness. We've never <laughs> tried a t- intimidation. Bully people. 
<laughs> so um, we we truly appreciate our patrons and those considering uh, talking uh, patreon.com slash talking about birds. Get in the bird scored. We're having a great time. Uh, we also would love it if you are enjoying the show. If you uh, smash that subscribe button and leave us a nice review on whatever your favorite podcast app is. Um, and yeah, Ben, why don't you tell people where they can find us online? Yeah, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Talk About Birds, where we're saying all kinds of stupid nonsense all the time. Follow us on Instagram at Talking About Birds. Uh, and of course, as always, you can email us at talkaboutbirds at gmail.com. Um, per usual, I encourage you to pry into Nate's personal life. As you may know, he spends a lot of time at Lake of the Ozarks. Maybe try to find out which cove they live on. I say go swing there by twice in the last six months. So I'd say he yeah, loves it. A lot of time, he yeah. loves it. He can't get enough of it. He goes down there. He gets a margarita. He sits the water, on the dock. The water tastes better down there. The lake water is my is favorite that true? water. I heard something about brain eating amoeba being in uh, potentially in southern Missouri. So maybe that's what's happened to you recently. I would feel more powerful than I've ever felt in my entire life. Really? No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, hit up Nate. Awesome. Uh, yeah, leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> ben and I will be at the Ozarks together in just a couple of weeks. Don't tell so, them. What? What do they? What, come on, come and hang out. You got to find us. Okay, we're the I, ones I, unsuccessfully fishing. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that actually might stick out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the last thing we're going to talk about, um, and we are by no means expert on this. Uh, I think we'll probably try to have uh, Kyle Reese, who we had on a couple episodes ago, uh, come back to really give us a breakdown on this. Um, he at least pretended like he wanted to come on the show again. So we're going to try <laughs> to hold him. We're going to try to hold him do that and have him really tell us a little bit about this. But uh, the uh, the MLB continuing to make, I think, good decisions around these sorts of things. Uh, ha now have the draft as a part of All Star Weekend, and it's it's all you know piled in there. Uh, the the MLB draft is maybe the least satisfying draft of all of the sports, though, because it's like, oh man, the Cardinals got a real gym with this one. He's one part Barry Bonds, he's one part <laughs> uh, Roger Clemens, and then it's like you don't hear about them again with a little bit years. of Larry Bird mixed in there. <laughs> yeah, and then you don't hear about them for four years or whatever. Yeah. But but I, anyway, I was, um, with all the all the former uh, superstars' kids being involved, that is that a little bit of excitement. I didn't think that I was yeah. going to be looking at uh, Matt Holiday on uh, draft day, but yeah, no, I agree. Well, it's also just kind of our generation of players and their kids yeah. are starting to come into it, which is a little weird. But, you know, it's like, uh, you know, right now, some of the biggest stars in the game are just kids of people who were big in the <laughs> early 2000s. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that was fun. Uh, Jackson Holiday, Matt Holiday's uh, son, uh, first overall. He apparently there was not that long ago, the Cardinals thought they might have a shot at him at their pick. And then he proceeded to hit almost 700, which is like you don't get those numbers in fucking beer league softball, let alone yeah. at any level of uh, actual competition. So the kid doesn't even grow beard hair yet. What is going to happen? <laughs> he looks like a yeah. baby. He does. He's like a goofy looking baby, but um, elite <laughs> athlete. So yes. uh, good for him. You know, they need the money. I'm glad he's uh, first overall. So, <laughs> uh, But yeah, it was uh, it was back to back to back kids of former, um, you know, major league players. So. Incredible. Yeah. Um, but like usual, the Cardinals don't have a pick until, uh, you know, the they've picked basically somewhere between like 17 and 23 for like like 19 of the last 20 years or something like that. Like it's, you know, that's just the way it's always been and it always will be. Yep. Um, and so they took, uh, their first pick Cooper Jerpy, um, which was generally very well received. Yeah. Um, I I've seen a lot of, um, uh, statements that he might be the first person from this draft to make it into the majors. Uh, some people saying that like he might be in the Cardinals bullpen this year, 
which I think is more of a statement on the current state of the Cardinal bullpen than necessarily, necessarily uh, Jerpy's skill set. But either way, between those two things, like, you know, that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, he's an interesting player from what we've learned quickly about him. Like you said earlier, we're, we're by no means prospect experts and are mostly just regurgitating things that we've read. But he's, you know, tall, skinny left hander, Chris Sale type uh, body and kind of throwing motion. He comes way out on the left side. Um, and he had he was the pitcher of the year in the NCAA last year, I believe, uh, or, or one of the most successful uh, pitchers in the uh, in, in college came from Oregon State. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what are you going to say? The results are there. He doesn't have a ton of gas, but the slider seems insane and he's got to change up to help neutralize righties. I think that's all good. Um, what, what I think is interesting is so we got Jerpy, Motz and Hansen, the first three picks by the Cardinals pick 22, 59, 97 all left-handed pitchers, all from big colleges, D1 colleges, um, and, and all about the same age, size, and height. The Cardinals had a plan. Um, they selected, I'll just kind of keep blabbering on, uh, they selected 13 pitchers, two infielders, four outfielders, and one catcher, um, and almost all of them were college players. The first of their 19 picks in the draft were college players. That has not been done by the Cardinals since 2004. Um, yeah, so it's pretty interesting. Like, it seems like Randy Flores and team, I think they have kind of had this reputation of going for the Jordan walkers and Mason wins. And, um, I guess Michael McGreevy would, would counter this argument, but they've been going for high ceiling type guys and seems like they wanted a bunch of maybe not so sure thing, but reliable pitching that they believe could move fast. Um, I don't know, you know, maybe Cooper, Her- uh, Jerpy, I was almost called him Herpy because of the spelling. Um, maybe Cooper Jerpy is going to be in a nationals uniform here soon. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know what the plan is, but it's definitely interesting. Yeah. They, they've commented on it a little bit saying that they did not go into the draft with the distinct intention of only drafting college players. Um, but you have to imagine though, with the way it turned out that their draft board was heavily college players, right? Yeah. Otherwise, how else does it end this way? So there was clearly some intentionality around that more advanced skill set, that more advanced age. Um, You kind of know what you're buying a little bit more when you're getting uh, college level players. And maybe that's because the, the farm system right now is super top heavy. And once you get past those, uh, you know, the big names that we all know, like there's not a lot going on down at the, lower lower levels where guys like this might be placed and then move quickly and fill out that middle round of of uh cardinal prospects i don't know you know i i I obviously at this point have the utmost trust in uh flores and and crew they uh the recent baseball america top 100 cardinals are the only team with seven players on it so like farm system working right um draft system I think it seems to be working i think it's also important to you know kind of talk about the cardinals player dev department a little bit and that it has kind of just become a thing and we talked about this with kyle a couple of weeks ago it's kind of just become a thing when you come into the cardinals minor league system your fastball ticks up and, and you know your fastball might tick up two or three miles per hour might tick up five or six miles per hour, but that has kind of been a thing that they've been good at doing. So it is, you know, maybe there is, they believe in their player dev. Maybe they look at a guy like Jerpy and they say he's sitting 93. We think we can get him to 95 and coming out of that slot. It's going to be really, really nasty. I mean, I, I think what you said is right. Like I really have to kind of sit back and wait. I'm, I don't really Just have defer much to, to the, and, Exactly. Yeah. Defer to the process and, and the and the Flores and team, and they've been doing a great job. Um, I think we're all pretty happy with where the Cardinals minor yeah. league system is without having tanked or anything like that. I think uh, I, I did read that they believe Jerpy uh, is pr- projects to have more velocity. It's pretty um, skinny kid. Um, yeah. Six three two hundred. Um, you, you know, there's there's some meat to put on them bones for sure. <laughs> He's it's it's somewhere around like a three quarters arm slot from the left handed side, which is it's um, real low. It's it's pretty funky. Yeah. And I think I saw it. I think it was Jerpy. He has like seven feet of extension 
on yeah. his uh, on his delivery. So between the left-handed slot, the the ex- the extension, um, a lot has been said about the, how uncomfortable he makes people, um, you know, in the box. And we've seen some very successful pitchers do that. And then if he can get it into the mid nineties, not that that's a necessity, but in today's game, that certainly uh, helps. You can see why. A lot of people are excited about this guy and the fact that he could maybe be in the majors as soon as this year. Also, uh, they always say they don't draft to like current needs. You know, you just take the best player, but it's hard not to think uh, we need pitching and your first pick is a maybe already MLB ready uh, starting pitcher. Like it's hard not to imagine there was some intention there for that. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it'd be fun from a fan standpoint, right? Like this happened with Waka and how much fun was that? So I yeah. say go for it. Let's see what the kids got. I think that'd be a lot of fun, especially in a pennant race. But, you know, we'll couldn't, see. Couldn't be worse. Knock, knock on wood. Than <laughs> TJ, TJ McFarlane or, uh, you know, Verhagen or whoever. Like yeah. there's a spot in the bullpen. Um, I, I'm not necessarily lobbying for this. I, I don't know. Like it's crazy to go straight from college to the majors, but it happens. Mike Leak, right? Didn't he go straight from what a great example? Yes, Mike Leake <laughs> did do that. Never touch the minors. <laughs> yeah. So Cardinal great. Cardinal great. I don't even 80, want to talk about Mike Leake. Eighty million dollars. Yeah. Yes. Move on. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to talk about with the draft? Uh no. I, I think, you know, the other interesting thing, Jimmy Crooks, catcher, one to twenty seventh overall. He was the fourth over, or the fourth pick. Yeah, good name. Um seems like a catcher that hits a lot and has a very strong arm. So tools are fun from that position. Um and then we got Victor Scott, who was drafted after him, one of the other few position players in the draft. Um, really only thing that's interesting about Victor Scott is he might have been one of the fastest guys in the draft. He had thirty eight stolen bases in a obviously a fairly short uh, college season. So that's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, lots of pitchers, uh, lots of college players. We'll, we'll kind of see, um, see what that does. I also, you know, and it's something I, I think I'll keep in the back of my head. Well, maybe we'll talk to Kyle about this one. If he, uh, we can wrangle him in is it, you know, is the college players, is that having something to do with COVID and the lost season and a lot of guys sticking around COVID? I'm curious if that's a factor, but, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. Like uh, we're already, jazzed about the last two drafts the Cardinals had so as we alluded to earlier I'm gonna I'm gonna be excited until I'm not on this one yeah well the 2020 draft is uh you know already looking like one of the best drafts that Cardinals have ever had and uh yeah. you know it's gonna be fun to watch them as Washington Nationals as uh <laughs> <laughs> all right um so we're gonna get, move to the end of the episode uh we're we're at that we're actually past the midway point, but you know, generally, you know, we consider the all-star break, the midway point, even though we're, we're, we're several games past that at this point, but, um, preseason Ben and I did a little game, um, that we called draft day. Uh, wait, was it stars and scrubs? Oh my God, it was heroes and hatchlings. Oh my God. Sorry. Uh, I got my game mixed up from, from what, two weeks ago, uh, draft day, Heroes and hatchlings. Because the, cause they're birds, because cardinals. Yeah, I get it. I forgot we had this. <laughs> All good. right. Just, just let that roll. We should stop yeah. talking. Thank you to associate sound producer Chris Phillips for that uh, that wonderful little sting there. Um, <laughs> so we we played a little game, and it's time for us to check in on that. Uh, we each selected uh, three major league players and three minor league players, and we want to see who at the end of the season has the most fan graphs war. Um, ben, you had the first overall pick, and uh, what a great so, choice I I had too. You did make a good choice, although they've been basically the same. But um, yeah, yeah. To, to recap our teams, um, I kind of like this because it's sort of a check in also. And just like, what are the best players on the team doing? Yeah, right. Um, although so, uh, famously, we did not draft 
Tommy Edmond, who is <laughs> yeah, been highly it's productive this season. But big we'll, oops. we'll, we'll we, pass that. We, yeah. we did our Tommy Edmond apology episode yes. several yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you know, Sorry, um, so Ben Ben's team, uh, and he had the first pick, so he could just assume this. You know, he he went after me, and we just did back and forth. We didn't do the snake style thing. So, um, Paul Goldschmidt, Tyler O'Neill. Harrison Bader, Brendan Donovan, Johan Oviedo, Alec Burleson. That was Ben's team. My team was Nolan Arenado, Dylan Carlson, Adam Wainwright, Nolan Gorman, Juan Yepes, and Matt Liberator. Now, when we did this, all of our minor league players were exactly that, minor league players. So uh, Brendan Donovan, Johanna Oviedo, Alec Burleson, Nolan Gorman, Juan Yepes, and Matt Libertor were starting the season in the minors. It's interesting to me that everyone except for Alec Burleson, who seems maybe right around the corner at this point, yeah. uh, have now been major league players for several Unless months. Unless he's a national, but yeah. Unless, oh yeah, he might be a national. Um, which I guess we didn't consider. I don't think it counts for you if if or or me. If any of these guys get traded... They are we'll, not. We'll have to go more. back and look at this, but I think it was just major league F four. We'll, we'll, we'll go back okay. and listen to the, this tape, but yeah, I'm quite sure. Good point. I also think that that's more fun. Um, because I will there say might that be some it, chaos in this draft here soon. If it hurts you, then I'm for it. <laughs> and if it hurts me, I'm against it. So that's going to be my, my general mm. angle on how these rules yeah. are decided. <laughs> You're good like that. Thank you. Um, so uh, we checked in last on May 18th, and uh, I had a pretty good lead because the last we did this, Arenado was was peak what we were getting from Arenado to start this season. Going One off. Player of the month in April was continuing it into May, um, and he really drove most of my my scores. Um, I was leading with a total of 3.1 F4, uh, 2.1 of that coming from Arenado. And you had uh, 2.4, similarly being driven by, uh, you know, your star, uh, um, Paul Goldschmidt, giving you 1.4. So I'm going to run down now where we're at, though, with the the individual numbers for each person. We'll do the total at the end. Does that sound good? That works. Okay. So uh, I, I think I'll do from what they were at at May 18th to what they're at now. Yeah, I yeah. think that's an interesting story. So we're we're almost exactly it, two months. It does tell a lot. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah. So uh, from May 18th to now, that's the two numbers. Paul Goldschmidt, May 18th, 1.4 fan graphs war. Now, 4.5. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah quite uh the the whole story is switched since we did yes. this in may in april or in, in may arenado is this the arenado mvp season uh, we'll talk about him in a minute that hasn't dwindled he's still having a great season but the whole story is swapped. goldschmidt front runner so your yeah. first overall pick it's it's bearing fruit it looked like i might have gotten the steal with arenado but um not anymore right they're they're uh, essentially tied um, Tyler O'Neill, May 18th, negative 0. 0.3. Ooh. Today, 0. 0.1. He's and, back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it is nice to go from negative to positive. Yeah. But I'm telling you, Nate, this second half, this this next, what what is it, 70 games or so, kid's yeah. going to be on fire. He's going to put up multiple war uh, I think that's really what's going to drive my championship is is the Tyler O'Neill getting healthy and yeah. whooping your ass. I well, I well now uh, I don't want to root yeah. against yeah. Tyler O'Neill, but I you agree with Tyler. you in that this game for you hinges on O'Neill's second half. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Harrison Bader, point six to one point five. Yeah, so nice, a pretty nice good couple production. months. Yeah. yeah, we hope he he comes back healthy. Um, Brendan Donovan, 0. 0.7 to 1.2. So you can kind of see the slowdown in there, yeah. right? He did um, 
seventy percent of of you know one win above replacement in like three weeks or whatever this was, and then in the last two months, still productive, half a war. You know, it's going to be better than a lot of guys, but um, mm. not the pace that he was on. No, no longer uh, like rookie of the year type contention. Yeah. That we were kind of hopeful at at one point. Yeah, uh, Johan Oviedo looking better lately. He went yeah. from zero because uh, he was not called up to point <laughs> two. So uh, you're getting some contribution from from your fifth round pick. Yeah. Uh, so that, ace. But, yeah. So you had a good, you had a very good last two months for this. You went from two point four. F four to seven point five. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Now for me, my first overall pick was Nolan Arenado. Uh, in May he had a two point one, so he had put up two point one WAR in six weeks, and uh, now he's at four point six. So still narrowly beating Goldschmidt, but um, yeah, Goldschmidt. Right. Well, has Which made a, has, variability that it's basically the same. It's basically the same for this yep. competition. It's not, but really it's the same. Here's the one that's working well for me. Oh yeah. Uh, when we did this in may Dylan Carlson had a zero war. Mind you, he had played the whole season. <laughs> yeah, it was a rough start. <laughs> so uh, he is now at 1.7 and we've been yeah. seeing it, right? The defense has been is awesome. Good. Uh, the, he's, he's, Everything's looked great for Dylan. Uh, Adam Wainwright, 0. 0.5 to 1.5. Kind of what you'd hope for a 40 yeah. year old pitcher. In the Eddie, Eddie, yeah. No, yep. no complaints. Uh, Nolan Gorman was not called up at that time. Now at 0. 0.8. Yeah. It's pretty stellar for, uh, you know, two months as a, as a rookie. And, and somewhat limited time, too. It's not like he, he was playing every night when he first got called up. Yep. My last two are where it starts to get a little bit of a bummer. So Juan Yepes was 0.5 in May, and he's now 0.1. So we're still big fans of him here on the show, but it's been it's been rough. He's got to make um, his adjustments. It's it's the whole thing. I, yeah. I don't think he's looked like horribly overmatched, but I'm not. I was not surprised to find those numbers, though. Yeah, yeah. He um. And then the injury, you know, maybe he was playing hurt. You know, it's yeah. hard to say, but uh, I think the hit tool is still there and we'll see. Uh, well, hopefully he can make the adjustments because the league obviously adjusted to him. And then uh, Matt Libertor, I have all six of my guys in the majors. You only have five. Unfortunately, Matt <laughs> Libertor is uh, he had zero in May and he's at negative point one so far yeah. for the season. Um it is what it is, right? Hopefully, I, I still feel very strongly about him in the starting rotation. Although, part of me thinks Zach Thompson might be starting to kind of surpass him on the on the depth chart. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll see where that goes. Neither of us took him. So, uh, ultimately, the the final score, I am still leading. Much Ooh. like I won the home run derby, I am still yes. winning this. Uh, yeah. Um, I have a total of 8.6 to Ben's. 7.5. Wow. So we're, you know, when it comes to war spread across six players, we're pretty close. Pretty close. Um, yeah. I, I have basically uh, the difference is my Dylan Carlson to your Tyler O'Neill. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm feeling good. I mean, Tyler's a, he's a production monster. He's going to, he's going to come back from injury and he's going to put up big numbers. And I think this will get really competitive really quickly. That being said, I don't see Dylan slowing down either. Dylan might just start stacking. Um, yeah. The way he looked there the last few weeks, especially. So yeah, I think we have a nice little competition going Not Not to mention if Alec Burleson comes up, the kid's going to hit all over the place. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there. I think there's a real chance that, Burleson replaces Yepes in the role yeah. that Yepes was was playing uh, in in the very near future. So uh, we'll see. So um, that'll do it for this week's episode of talking about birds. Thank you, as always, for being a part of this, for joining us this week. Uh, find us online. Talk to us. Tell us what what you like, what you don't like, especially you know if you want to. Say you don't like Ben, just <laughs> let us know. Um, yeah. I've been thinking about taking this show solo anyway. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, somebody needs to bring me down. Yeah. Um, and uh, we welcome the return of normal games 
And, uh, you know, we have an exciting second half. Cardinals have the easiest schedule in baseball, according to some some reports. So that'll be interesting. And uh, it's it, uh, hopefully Juan Soto joins the fold and, uh, <laughs> you know, puts him over the edge. So we'll be back next week, as always, at the same time with another episode. And until then, go Cardinals. Thank you. Bye.